a few things I want to do in terms of clearing, clearing house. One, to really thank the Benjamin Hooks um, Institute for Social, Social Change uh, for, this, for this award. Um, when, you, when you write and study about uh, black uh, people, and especially black radicals, um, it's not often that uh, that work uh, is acknowledged. And so it's, it's very, very um, humbling to have that work acknowledged. And uh, I, I would definitely want to thank um, everyone here at University of Memphis uh, who I met in 2011 when I spoke here before. Um, I met a, a, a tremendous group of young students who were pursuing African American history. And um, I gave a lecture talking about um, why and how uh, that is such an honorable uh, vocation um, to do and a life's mission and life's work. I'm very happy to see that there's Dr. Uh, KT Ewing is in the house right now. Um, and she was in grad school when I first met her. And I'm always, always, even as um, I'm sobered by the challenges that we face in terms of race relations, economic justice, um, issues of gender justice, issues of labor, uh, LGBT, all these issues of, of injustice that people like Kwame Touré, Stokely Carmichael talked about. I'm always very, very optimistic um, when I meet young people uh, traveling around uh, the country and the world who are engaged in the work of, of radical social political justice and change. Um, so that being said, um, I think I want to start before diving deep into Stokely and Kwame Touré and why this Black Lives Matter movement and moment is very much of a Stokely moment. Um, it's very much, this is the 50th anniversary in October of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, but really this spring is the 50th of the Black Panther Party in Lowndes County, Alabama, right? And the Lowndes County Freedom Organization um, and, and, and uh, the, these radical movements for social and political transformation that continue to reverberate and echo in our own time. Um, and what's, what's extraordinary about this time period over the last 24 months is the way in which there's been so many echoes of the 1960s. Um, and I think most people would, would understand what I'm, what I'm saying. And these echoes have been both in the social and political protests and demonstrations, the kind of demonstrations that we haven't seen on a mass level since the early 1970s, since student strikes in 1970 where 1.5 million students um, took off in 1970 in the aftermath of Kent State, um, since uh, roiling um, labor protests that continued to happen in the 1970s in places like Youngstown, Ohio, in places like New York City. My mother is 76 years old, and he, she's a retired trade unionist, SCIU 1199. So I was on my first picket line in New York City in elementary school, and these are some of the values that <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Sofer was talking about that I was, I was definitely um, inculcated with vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis my mother. And I always give my mother um, uh, acknowledgement in any talks that I give, because I wouldn't be here uh, without her. And uh, it's very, very important to do that and acknowledge that. And it's very, very uh, Stokely, Kwame Touré would say it's, it's, it's very, very African to do that as well. Um, I grew up in Southside Jamaica, Queens, uh, during a very, very difficult time in New York City's history in the 1970s and 80s. Um, there was race war happening in the streets of New York City. Um, uh, Michael Griffith was killed in Howard Beach in December of 1986 in New York City. So I grew up in a context and in a household that was a, not only a labor household, but was an anti-racist household. It was also a feminist household. It was also a Haitian diasporic household. My mother uh, is a Haitian uh, immigrant who came to the United States in 1965. I'm the proud son of Haitian immigrants. And the one thing that she always told us was the way in which Caribbean, African, and African-American history intersected. Um, we grew up, my older brother who's a doctor, we grew up in a household where the first book our mother gave us was CLR James' The Black Jacobins. And she gave you that when you were in the fourth grade and she expected you to read it. This is not 
I'm not laughing because I actually have to read it. Um, my mother is the strongest person I know, the most disciplined person I know, the most resilient person I know. Um, and she has such a powerful belief in social uh, justice that that has animated my entire life. So I'm 43 years old and I've been doing this for 35 years. So even as a young boy in New York City, I was volunteering. Um, even as a young boy in New York City, um, I was demanding black history in my high school classes and in my, my junior high classes. It was in junior high that I first encountered Stokely Carmichael in the award-winning television series, Eyes on the Prize. Um, and there was Eyes on the Prize 1 and Eyes on the Prize Part 2, and collectively they form about 14 hours of the most important um, documentary television series that has ever been produced, uh, I think, in, in, in American history. Uh, because it gives you a, a bird's eye view of uh, the civil rights struggle, but a panoramic view of the black freedom struggle. So in Eyes on the Prize, you get Montgomery, Alabama, you get the sit-in movement, but you also get Attica, right, uh, 1971. And, and Heather Ann Thompson has a, a brilliant new book coming out about Attica and connecting it to mass incarceration now. Uh, you also get um, Howard University, uh, Muhammad Ali. You get the Gary Convention from March of 1972 in the National Black Political Association. You get the black mayors, Maynard Jackson, but you get Dr. King and Memphis in that series. Um, uh, you get Harold Washington in 1983 and Chicago. And Harold Washington, of course, first African-American mayor of Chicago, but who also greatly influenced Barack Obama. But you get Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael. And, and uh, in that episode, um, the time has come. I, 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 was, I was riveted by the sight of, of uh, Stokely Carmichael uh, not only talking about black power in Mississippi in June of 1966, but uh, Stokely Carmichael organizing um, sharecroppers uh, in, in, in Mississippi and Alabama. Uh, Stokely Carmichael uh, talking about institutional racism um, and white supremacy. Stokely Carmichael talking about the Vietnam War, and I wanted to find out who was this Stokely Carmichael. And so um, I really spent the next uh, 25 years, in a way, trying to find out about Stokely Carmichael, uh, the Black Power Movement, the civil rights struggle, and, and why this story wasn't, wider, wasn't shared in a, in, a, in a wider manner. And so today, what I want to talk about is Stokely Carmichael, but connect Stokely black power to the contemporary moment that we're in. Because I think when we talk about Black Lives Matter, when we talk about the movement uh, to end mass incarceration, and I can move around a little bit, we really are in a Stokely Carmichael black power moment right here. And it's a moment that impacts us at the local, regional, national, but also global level. There's a reason why in the aftermath of the protests that have been really unfolding uh, in the United States since the summer of 2014 and the death of Michael Brown, that um, the President of the United States uh, met with activists in December of 2014 at the White House, but he really followed that up with uh, the, a visit to a federal prison in Oklahoma, becoming the first sitting president to ever do that, and he's called for um, at least reform of the criminal justice system. When people talk to me about Black Lives Matter and public policy and what public policy initiatives do BLM activists have, well, some chapters have many public policy initiatives. Um, you can go to fergusonaction.org and get, get those from mass incarceration to, to employment, um, to a complete rethinking of both the criminal justice system and the public school system. Others are less interested in public policy and really want to raise political consciousness. And in a way, that connects with what happened in the post-war period. We usually think about the heroic period of the civil rights movement as being between 1954 and 1965. So May 17, 1954 is the Brown decision, August 6, 1965 is the Voting Rights Act, and in between you've got the assassination of Emmett Till in 1955. And remember, Emmett Till um, is the precursor to 
to Trayvon Martin, right? So the, those, those, those comparisons between Till and Martin are always apt because it was another innocent, uh, four, this, this one, 14 years old, uh, who, was, who was assassinated and lynched in Money, Mississippi uh, for saying bye, baby, to a white woman. Um, and Emmett Till is going to become a martyr. Uh, his body is found in the Tallahatchie River with a 125-pound cotton gin fan belt tied around his neck. And his mother is going to allow uh, his body to be seen in an open casket. And that's going to be the cover of Jet Magazine in 1955. Stokely talks about seeing it. John Edgar Wideman, the African-American novelist, talks about seeing it. So in a way, what Emmett Till becomes is a generational touchstone that allows us to see the breadth and depth of white supremacy in 1955. But it's something that's going to radicalize people like Stokely Carmichael. Stokely is in New York City, but he's being mentored by people like Bayard Rustin. And Bayard Rustin is the, the, the leading um, social democratic activist of the post-war period, uh, openly gay, uh, organizer of the March on Washington, but also a mentor in 55, 56 to Dr. King. Uh, go sneaks into Montgomery, Alabama, uh, had been a pacifist, had gone to jail um, for, for, for uh, uh, refusing um, to serve in World War II, was part of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, A.J. Musty, just such a rich history. And Bayard is the person who's really um, influencing Stokely in the 1950s in New York City. And, and I, I, uh, when, when I always do this, this pause for 54 to 65, it's to, it's to give people a little touchstone of how we usually think about it and then do a remix. So 55 is Emmett Till. Um, 55, 56 is a 381 day bus boycott, Rosa Parks. Uh, we should all get Jean Theo Harris's book uh, on Rosa Parks, which uh, is a brilliant book and gives us a much different way of looking at Rosa Parks as a, as a radical political activist. Uh, 57 is Little Rock Central High School crisis, um, where, where, where mobs of, of uh, 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 whites try to prevent the first African Americans who are integrating Little Rock uh, High School. Um, 1960 is the start of the sit-in movement. Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee um, is the outgrowth of that. February 1st, 1960, uh, the Greensboro, uh, North Carolina, Woolworth's lunch counter is now a museum, right? And uh, Ella Baker, uh, Miss Ella Jo Baker, is the leading organizer of this entire period. She's the person who organizes the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, she's the person who mentors um, Stokely Carmichael, Diane Nash. Uh, she's the one who tells them that what they're fighting for in 1960, Easter weekend at Shaw University, April 15th to April 17th, is about more than just a hamburger. Because even by the spring of 1960, what the newspapers like the New York Times are saying is that, well, these young people just want, they just want to get a hamburger, right? They just want to get a, 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 you know, some coffee. And Ella Baker is saying this is about more than just a hamburger. This is about democracy. This is about citizenship. This is about our entire society. Um, James Baldwin uh, goes further. James Baldwin says, and he writes, that the young people who are protesting uh, and sitting in, in the spring of 1960, are sitting in for more. And what Baldwin says is uh, they want to do more than just um, um, sip tasteless cups of coffee uh, at sleazy lunch counters in the South. That's, Jim, that's Jimmy Baldwin. And so what's interesting for us is that even then, and Stokely's going to be a part of this, and we're, we're going to get to him, I promise. Um, what's interesting is that when we think about that heroic period of the Civil Rights Movement, we, we don't think about the, how, how tumultuous this was, right? Um, SNCC was not popular. The young people go from four black students at A&T to over 50,000 sit in that spring. And there's, there's sympathy demonstrations all across the country. Um, 61 is the Freedom Rides, and we've got the great book by Ray Arsenal on the Freedom Rides uh, from May 
to December of 1961. Stokely's gonna be a freedom rider. He's not a celebrated freedom rider, but he's arrested June 8th, 1961 uh, in Jackson, Mississippi as a freedom rider. Uh, he's gonna spend over 40 days in Parchman Penitentiary as a freedom rider. He's gonna celebrate his 20th birthday in prison. Um, John Lewis is in prison. We know who John Lewis is. Uh, we don't know who Stokely is because Stokely is a revolutionary. And, and, and decades later, you don't celebrate revolutionaries who you can't rehabilitate. And you can't rehabilitate people who wanted black liberation in an unapologetic, uncompromising fashion. And that's who Stokely Carmichael Kwame Touré was and is and remains. Um, 1962 is James Meredith, becomes the first black student to enroll at the University of Mississippi. There's three days of rioting um, right here on U.S. soil domestically at the prospect of this, this first black graduate student. And I always emphasize that because it tells us a lot about the society that we live in. We should not be um, surprised at the spate of police shootings and killings. The latest one in Austin, 17-year-old uh, black boy was just shot. Uh, to death by a black police officer. Uh, this boy was having a mental breakdown. He was naked, he was unarmed, it was at night, and he, he was just shot to death uh, two days ago. Um, 1963 is the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation, but it's also the year of Birmingham. And that's the year that Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference they connect with the local movement led by Fred Shuttlesworth to try to desegregate public accommodations and really the entire city of Birmingham. And it's when King is arrested in April that he writes letter from a Birmingham jail. And the lines that really come out of that letter, he's being criticized for moving too fast. Uh, people are saying, why can't you wait? And King says that the young people who are being criticized and the movement that's being criticized in Birmingham that one day people are going to remember that they brought this nation back to those great wells of democracy that were dug deep by the founding fathers and they're going to be lionized instead of demonized. King was right. Um, 63 is also the year of March on Washington. We talk about March on Washington August 28, 63, but before the March on Washington there's a great walk for freedom in Detroit, June 23rd, 1963. And that's gonna be organized by both uh, radical labor activists, radical black power activists, and mainstream religious activists, 125,000 people. And that's where King is gonna make the first version of the I Have a Dream speech. Motown is gonna release uh, King's speech um, on a record. Uh, Barry Gorder is a supporter of that march, and it's a sympathy demonstration for what's going on in Birmingham. When we think about the March on Washington, August 28, 1963, King's speech there uh, is a radical speech and it's a call for reparations. The, the same thing Bernie Sanders doesn't want. It's a call for reparations. And he starts that speech by saying, now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. That's how he starts that speech. He says that we come to Washington, the nation's capital, to cash a check a check that has been stamped insufficient funds, but we refuse to believe that the Bank of American Justice is bankrupt. That's what Dr. King says that day. We always remember the I have a dream portion uh, because we live in a nation that has historical amnesia and remembers to forget. That's the nation we live in. This is the United States of amnesia because we do not want to talk about in-depth social, political, racial injustice. We don't want to talk about structural racism. We don't want to talk about the economic inequality buried in structural capitalism and it's racialized capitalism because it's unequal. Uh, black homeowners get treated differently from white homeowners. Um, uh, uh, black wealth is almost non-existent in this country. So when we think about race, class, gender, these are the, the, the sexuality, these are the, the things that we don't want to talk about. Um, 63 is also the year the four little girls get bombed. Uh, September 15th uh, at the 16th Street Baptist uh, Church bombing. Um, there's a scene in Selma 
that, that, that evokes that, even though the timeline is off, but I understand, I had, I had uh, dinner with Ava DuVernay, and I understand why um, she did that. She wanted to evoke the violence that was happening um, to black bodies, uh, even before this contemporary Black Lives Matter moment. Um, 64 is gonna be Freedom Summer, the signing of the Civil Rights Act, July 2nd, 1964. Uh, Freedom Summer, uh, SNCC is gonna try to um, really bring small d democracy to Mississippi um, uh, in 1964. Uh, three civil rights workers, really uh, more than that are killed, but the ones we, we remember, the iconography is Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman, um, who are gonna be, uh, they go missing uh, June 21st, uh, 1964, outside of Philado Philadelphia, Neshoba County, Mississippi. Um, their bodies are gonna be found August 4th, 1964. Uh, uh, when we think about why that becomes such a big deal, two of them were white and one of them were black, uh, was black. Uh, even in 1964, as in 2016, um, black lives mattered less uh, to the nation, to its democratic institutions, um, to its politicians, uh, to its polity uh, than white lives. Um, 1965 is the year of Selma, and, and then um, I'll start the lecture. Um, is the year of Selma. Uh, and when you think about 1965, Selma is so important because there was always grassroots movement for voter registration. What SCLC tries to do, this is what Dr. King was. King is a mobilizer. King is a mobilizer. He's certainly going to become a revolutionary political mobilizer, but he's a mobilizer. The organizing is happening on the ground the ground view, right? And it's happening state by state, county by county, neighborhood by neighborhood. What King does, and the genius of King is that he can, he can shine a light on that organizing by hooking in with local groups. And that's what he does in Selma. He does it in a lot of different places. But, but March 7th, Bloody Sunday in Selma is when uh, 500 nonviolent demonstrators are gonna be routed by Alabama state troopers, including by some on horse back and and uh, two days later turnaround Tuesday um, King leads them uh, to the Pettus Bridge but he he turns back uh, SNCC activists and others are angry uh, but King didn't know what kind of violence was going to happen if he didn't turn back um, but what we're going to see is thousands are going to descend uh, on Selma um, to try to serve as public witnesses to uh, these brutal, horrific acts of not just institutional racism, but, but, but white supremacy that goes back to uh, the, the nation's antebellum period, right? The period of antebellum slavery. Um, uh, some of this is gonna be showcased on CBS and other networks, um, but, but there's gonna be a global response. By, by March 15th, Lyndon Johnson, uh, who becomes president after uh, John F. Kennedy's November 22nd, uh, 63 assassination, he's gonna to have a joint address to the Congress where he says that the civil rights demonstrators who've been demonized and physically brutalized in Selma are um, the same as Americans who fought during the Revolutionary War in Concord and Lexington, Massachusetts. So what, what Johnson does is at least publicly and rhetorically embrace the Civil Rights Movement in that speech. Uh, he talks about the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy, and he ends that speech with we shall overcome. Um, the march continues March 21st to March 25th, uh, and, and uh, that public address King gives in 65 at the end of the march is the last time um, the majority of Americans ever saw King uh, deliver a speech. Um, what's interesting for us and how we can dovetail back into Stokely Carmichael, and now the rest is going to be Stokely, I promise, is Stokely is at the march. And Stokely, who didn't necessarily support what they were doing, He's gonna go with SNCC activists into Lowndes County, Alabama. And Lowndes is located between Selma and Montgomery. 
And when we think about what, you know, first of all, who was um, Stokely Carmichael? Who was Kwame Ture? Uh, Stokely Carmichael was born uh, June 29th, 1941 in Port of Spain, Trinidad. Uh, he comes to the United States uh, in 1952, two weeks before his 11th birthday. Uh, between 1952 and 1960, he lives in New York City and becomes a political organizer and activist in New York City. He's organizing garment workers in Harlem. Um, he's, he's part of study groups. Uh, he goes to Bronx Science High School. He's one of eight African Americans who are, eight black people, I should say, who are part of the class of 1960 at Bronx Science. He tests into Bronx Science before affirmative action. Uh, he's a brilliant student. Um, he's, a, he's a budding organizer. And by the time the sit-ins happen in 1960, he's ready to go. Uh, he could have gone to a range of universities, but he goes to Howard University in Washington, D.C., which is obviously the black intellectual mecca um, of the post-war period, and I would, I would argue it continues to be. Um, Stokely becomes part of the nonviolent action group in DC at Howard University. That's going to be SNCC's affiliate at Howard. And so between 1960 and 1964, Carmichael is both a student and a full time political activist. Uh, he goes down south for the first time in the summer of 1961 and is going to spend every single summer thereafter in Mississippi. Um, Stokely uh, lives on the, sleeps on the floors of shotgun shacks in Mississippi, Alabama. Uh, he connects with rural sharecroppers. He connects with their children. The big connection between Stokely Carmichael and Martin Luther King Jr., who he meets in 1963, is a profound and unapologetic love for black people, especially poor black people. Uh, Stokely comes to meet black people in the Mississippi Delta who never will have a birth certificate, are never going to have a certificate of death, some who've never seen legal currency because they've been in a plantation system of peonage and sharecropping and a feudal system um, that is, is backed by white supremacy and not just Eastland, Senator Eastland in Mississippi, but Washington DC as well. Not just the South, but the North as well. And not just the North, but the West Coast as well. Stokely's going to come to have a national indictment of the entire United States based on the suffering of poor black people who he meets with, who he lives with, who he eats food with, who he organizes with, who he, he dialogues with for the rest of his life. He's going to connect the poverty he sees in the Mississippi Delta to the poverty he sees in Guinea and parts of Africa. When we think about what he's doing between 1960 and 1964, more than any other radical black activist of that period, he's got a foot in both civil rights and black power. He organizes at the local level in a different way than Malcolm X does in Harlem. So even as Malcolm is the avatar of black power, Stokely's call for black power is based on his organizing experiences, including the experience of seeing democracy wilt and fade away at the 1964 Democratic National Convention. And that's when Mrs. Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer and Aaron Henry and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party um, organize, they organize a challenge to the white supremacist segregated delegation at the Democratic National Convention. They have an interracial delegation and they are not seated by the President of the United States. And that's what's going to push Stokely to say that there is no small d democracy through these mainstream political institutions because they are unapologetically corrupt. And he's going to say, he's going to try to organize independent black politics. And that's the move towards Lowndes County in 1965 to live and toil and be arrested with sharecroppers in Alabama. As late as March of 1965, there's two African Americans in Lowndes County who are registered to vote, a county of over 3,000 residents, 80% black. Black people hadn't had voting rights in Lowndes County since the period of Reconstruction. And that's 1865 to 1877. So what Stokely 
and John Hewlett and organizers in Lowndes do is organize independent black political a black political party that's going to be nicknamed the Black Panther Party. Lowndes County Freedom Organization. And that Black Panther Party and the symbol of that Black Panther Party is going to reverberate nationally and then globally. So when we think about the Black Panthers and Bobby Seale and Kathleen Cleaver and Huey P. Newton, there would be no Black Panther Party except for the work that poor people were doing in Alabama in 1965 and 66 and 67 and 68. People still don't want to talk about that. Sometimes the Panthers don't want to talk about that. Right? The, 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 the Black Panthers and that revolutionary impetus is coming from southern soil. That's where it's coming from. And Stokely is a big part of that. And Stokely, in the aftermath of staying in Lowndes County, uh, becomes chairman of SNCC in 1966. And it's as chairman of SNCC during the, the Meredith March. James Meredith is, is, is going to be marching from Memphis, uh, uh, to Jackson, Mississippi, a one-man march against fear that starts on J June 5th, 1966. He's shot on the second day, and Dr. King, uh, James Lawson, Stokely, uh, so many different activists come down to, uh, uh, they come down to, to, to Memphis. They, they, they go to um, um, Bold Hospital. Uh, they check in on uh, Meredith, who's injured but not killed. And they say they're going to resume his march. And it's during that march from June 7th to June 26th, 1966, that Carmichael tries to organize sharecroppers. They try to organize people, register votes, but they also unleash this term black power. And it's this term that SNCC had been trying to organize around. And what they meant by black power was radical, social, political, economic, cultural self-determination. That black people were going to define phenomena, right, including their own oppression, for themselves. And what's remarkable about the black power period is the way in which that term gets misconstrued, right? That term has been uh, misconstrued as being violent, as being anti-white. That term was a term to try to transform democratic institutions in American society. And many, even among African Americans, there's going to be among black folks, there's going to be different interpretations of what black power means. There's going to be some conservatives who say black power means black businesses. Uh, Richard Nixon said he was all for black power as long as it's black capitalism. <laughs> um, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, his vision of black power, we're going to see it through not only the organizing that he does in 66, 67, 68, but through his anti-war organizing and his anti-imperial vision. Um, he's going to become the leading anti-Vietnam war protester in the United States before Dr. King. People don't give Stokely credit, and I understand why. You cannot rehabilitate a revolutionary. I get it. I get it. There, there's no, there, there's never going to be a Stokely Carmichael Kwame Ture stamp. You're not getting a holiday. There's no, there's no, you can, you can, you can manufacture and innovate that for yourselves. You can take the day off. I'll take the day off, June 29th. It's like, I'm not coming into work. It's, it's Kwame Ture's day. Um, there's not going to be the holiday because of what, what, what Carmichael is standing for. By 66, 67, his criticism against the Vietnam War and his call for black power is going to lead to constant surveillance by the FBI, by local law enforcement, the CIA, the State Department. Um, the White House is going to request twice weekly reports on his activities. Because what Stokely starts to say is that black people have to organize for black power because the system of institutional racism goes beyond liberal democratic solutions. Right. right? That's what he's going to start saying. And when we think about the Vietnam War, he's going to connect the war in Vietnam to what's going on in urban and rural areas in the United States. He connects the poverty that contours and shadows the lives of poor black people to expenditures that are happening globally. 
It's Stokely who coins the phrase, hell no, we won't go, and is screaming that at the top of his lungs at Howard University, at Berkeley. When we think about what Carmichael represents, even before we get to uh, the, his, his affiliation in the Black Panthers, Carmichael is gonna represent a challenge to not just institutional racism, but liberal frameworks of how we solve and confront institutional racism. What's interesting for us is that he had at one point participated in those liberal frameworks. He comes to reject them through experience. So he is the black power icon of his generation who had been in Lowndes County. He had been in Mississippi. He had been in Southwest Georgia. He's got a relationship with Martin Luther King Jr., which was one of the uh, uh, best parts about writing the book, is that King and, and Carmichael love each other, even though they have profound disagreements. Because on some levels, they, they are, on, on, on big levels, they are both two political revolutionaries who, who, who have different strategies and tactics towards transformation. Um, King, by 65, 66, 67, 68, but especially by 67, 68, becomes an unapologetic uh, political revolutionary. King is the person who's talking about militarism, materialism, racism as the triple threats facing humanity. Now, King's strategy is going to be different than Stokely's strategy. King is gonna be talking about a, a poor people's campaign, right? And, and Memphis is a big part of this. We've got, we've got Michael Honey in the room who's written the definitive history of that, going down Jericho Road about King and Memphis. Carmichael's gonna have a different take. He's gonna say that you cannot transform a society that is built on racial and economic exploitation. That's gonna be his take. And that since black people are dying, they're gonna to need to organize and defend themselves against this racist onslaught. And that's where the Black Panthers come in. Black Panther Party for Self-Defense becomes this revolutionary organization. And once Huey Newton is arrested in 1967, He's put on trial in 1968. He's on trial for allegedly killing a police officer. The free Huey P. Newton movement is going to become the leading radical edge of anti-racist, anti-imperialist politics of the period. Stokely is gonna speak February 17th, February 18th in Oakland and Los Angeles at massive gatherings um, uh, uh, that are designed as consciousness raising efforts but also to raise money uh, for UEP Newton's defense. And when we think about what the Panthers are articulating by 1968, they initially start as revolutionary nationalists. By 68, they're saying they're full-blown revolutionary socialists. America is an imperial power and that the people, both in the United States but also third world, are gonna have to get together and try to overthrow a corrupt regime. Certainly there's gonna be pushback. And I think one of the lessons of the BPP is that if you're saying that and you're, you're, you're you know, part of the 10 point program, it's really 20 points, what we want, what we believe, ending police brutality, releasing uh, black folks from jail, um, having black studies and, and, and radical education, uh, they end in a rhetorical flourish of land, peace, bread, justice. If you say that and you're also armed and at times taking a provocative stance toward law enforcement, um, there's gonna be major upheaval and major conflict, right? And so in a way, state-sanctioned violence and repression are really gonna contour um, much of the existence of the Black Panther Party. There's another side of the party which is talking about sur survival pending revolution, free breakfast programs, free, free buses to prison programs, free health clinics in places like Chicago. Congressman Bobby Rush is part of this, right? Fred Hampton is gonna be assassinated on December 4th, 1969 by Chicago PD because of daring to say that what's going on in Chicago vis-a-vis -vis black people is completely corrupt, right? And that there needs to be some kind of revolutionary change. Um, Chicago PD burned down the Black Panther offices, including cereal for children. Mm -hmm. So when we think about what, what 
revolutionaries like Carmichael and the Panthers, what they cast a strobe light on is not just uh, racial, economic, uh, political injustice. They cast a strobe light on a society that is predicated on the dehumanization and the demonization and the super exploitation of black bodies. And this is going to be my segue to Black Lives Matter. When we think about the moment we're in now, what Carmichael, who becomes Kwame Touré, goes to Conakry, and he's going to live in Conakry between 69 and 1998. Carmichael becomes a revolutionary pan Africanist. He's, he's, he's mentored by Kwame Nkrumah and Sekou Touré. And we can talk about the ins and outs of that and, and some criticisms of that period too. Um, but what he says about America as an empire and America being this imperialist nation and this, this racist nation, we are living in a moment where we have young people and young activists who are saying the same thing. We also have long marchers. We have people who've been in the struggle. And what's interesting about this moment, this Black Lives Matter movement, but also this moment, this moment where you've got people like ta Coates, Between the World and Me, National Book Awards, in a context where a couple of years ago, people wouldn't have cared about a book like that, okay? Not the mainstream, not talking about black folks or black intellectuals. We've got, we've got um, so much movement. Uh, we've got the President of the United States doing a eulogy in Charleston, South Carolina, where he's talking about racism. He's talking about the Confederate flag. And he's got the temerity to say that, race, that slavery was wrong, right? We've got, we've got uh, 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 the President talking in Selma and giving this panoramic history of, in Selma uh, last March. Uh, he, was, he was quoting Langston Hughes. I couldn't believe it. By the time he's quoting Langston Hughes, Right? We are in a very, very specific moment in American history. And we're in a moment of not only social and political movement upheaval, we're in a moment of massive backlash. All you have to do is see the presidential campaigns, the scapegoating of immigrants, the scapegoating of poor people, uh, the conflation between terrorism and religious beliefs. Right? What's so important, and I think the, the lesson that Stokely Carmichael Kwame Touré provided was speaking truth to power no matter what the cost. The lesson that he provides, sometimes people ask me, what's the main lesson you get from, from Kwame Touré, Stokely Carmichael? The lesson is that he's an unapologetic promoter of black liberation in this country, in this country, also globally. But in this country, it is very difficult to do that. Uh, you say black lives matter, people then say all lives matter, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's something deeply problematic that in 2016, many Americans still don't understand that you can say black lives matter and black can be universal, okay? It can be universal. The struggle in the 21st century, and this connects with the struggle for, to end mass incarceration, right? Mass incarceration impacts blacks, Latinos. Um, whites are eight times more likely to be arrested for drug crimes than they were in 1983. Latinos, 22 times more likely. African Americans, 28 times more likely. But the reason you say black lives matter is that disproportionately, disproportionately, those who are on the negative end of bad social economic indicators are black people in this country, both historically and now, and those who, who've got the smallest share of positive social economic indicators, whether you're talking about wealth or health or employment, right, are black people then and now. And when it comes to large segments of the black community, there's 42 point five million black people in terms of census data. 28% um, live below the poverty line. 40% of black children live below the poverty line. Another 35% are part of the working poor. Uh, black people are disproportionately represented among the two million people who are incarcerated in the United States right now. By the, 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 the day Obama stepped into office, uh, black men were seven times more likely to be in prison uh, than their counterparts. Uh, black women, almost three times more likely to be in prison. One of the fastest growing rates of incarceration right now are black and black, brown women. Um, there's, there's disparate sentencing. Uh, there's disparate outcomes. 
These are all part and parcel of when we think about racism in the 21st century, this is how we see racism in the 21st century. There are no more signs of colored and white. Even as racial segregation is at a high point right now, residential segregation, public school segregation, according to the data, is the highest it's been since the early 1970s. Black youth unemployment is a, is a national catastrophe that no one is talking about, right? And even as people talk about Bernie Sanders and some kind of economic uplift, there's no way you're gonna get economic uplift if you've got an institutionally racist society. Saying that you're gonna somehow make it all good, it's gonna be even Steven, is the same as the conservative colorblind racism ideology that announces that we're all equal. So Sanders has a Black Lives Matter uh, 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 moment where they heckle him, and now he's talking about black folks, right? He's talking about black folks with Killer Mike, so we got him talking about racial justice at gunpoint. Right. There's something deeply problematic when in 2016 you can't connect racial and economic justice, that you can't connect race, class, gender, sexuality. They're all braided together. Right? I'm gonna close. When we think about Stokely Carmichael and, and, and what he represented, and now I'll say Kwame Ture. Kwame Ture, uh, at the end of his life, uh, was a leader of a group called the All African People's Revolutionary Party. He came back and forth from Conakry to the United States and was really talking about political revolution long after its expiration date had passed in the American political imagination. Uh, there's a great um, line in Barack Obama's book, Dreams from My Father, where he talks about seeing Kwame Ture at Columbia Universe, University in the early 1980s. And the line he writes is that um, um, Kwame Ture is speaking passionately about Africa, about imperialism, about what we need to organize. And Obama writes that his eyes glowed inward, the eyes of a madman or a saint. That's what Obama writes. And I, I take great umbrage with that, of course. Right. Um, um, Kwame Ture was neither a madman or a saint. What he was what a, was an was a uncompromising, um, defiantly visionary revolutionary. All right? He was a revolutionary who, unlike some of his counterparts, never ran for elected office, um, never took money from foundations or corporations, um, never uh, 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 tried to become a, 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 a university professor in the Ivy League, all things which he could have done. Um, he, he remained, till the day he died on November 15, 1998, committed to this idea of political revolution, a world uh, where human rights were sacrosanct, a world where poverty did not exist, a world where anti-black racism wasn't normative and wasn't like the oxygen that we breathe, a world much different than the world we live in right now. And I think for that, he remains one of the most important figures that the 20th century has ever produced. And in that sense, he bestrides the global stage of post-war decolonization alongside of Malcolm X, alongside of Martin Luther King Jr., even though scholars won't embrace it. We've got, um, Aram has the great book da Down at the Crossroads, which looks at the Meredith March. But just because liberal whites and liberal blacks won't embrace Carmichael's legacy doesn't mean that he doesn't have as expansive of a legacy as I'm arguing. I know he does. The, the empirical evidence is right there. So what I'm always excited about when I talk about Kwame Ture is all you have to do is investigate it yourself, right? And I've made it my life's mission to talk about black power unapologetically, to talk about people like Kwame Ture, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, unapologetically, and to link them to the public policy and racial and class and economic crises that we face right here in the United States, right? If you don't know who Kwame Ture and Stokely Carmichael was, you have no chance to have a progressive or radical or revolutionary vision for social justice in our own time. Thank you.